Hello, this is Dr. Ford Brewer with PrevMed, heart attack, stroke, cancer, disability prevention. Again, prevention may be difficult, may require discipline, but it's a heck of a lot better than having to get a cure, especially if the cure is uh, surgery, <coughs> like a bypass graft. It occurred to me that after a couple of years of a bail donating practice uh, full-time, I haven't done a... Uh, a book review for the channel here, the YouTube channel, on the book that uh, that this is all based on. It's called Beat the Heart Attack Gene, um, written by Brad Bale, Amy Dunneen. Um <clears throat> And it's a great book, obviously, with uh, the comments that I've, I've already made. I think you can see I, I'm a big fan. One of the things that's unique about this book is that at all levels of medical training, from cardiologist uh, to physician to uh, nurses, even lay public, you see major devotees to this book, a lot of interest and uh, excitement around it. Now, why would that be? Um, I think it's a, another unique issue, and that is that it deals with a part of heart attack and stroke prevention that we've just neglected in, this, in the uh, traditional medical community. That is inflammation, uh, cardiovascular inflammation. Again, the book is built on the concept that um, that's true that doctors know of, but we tend to not have not practiced in this area. We've tended to practice on the assumption that. Um, Heart attacks and strokes are caused by uh, plaques which clog up the arteries. That's not what happens. And if you ask a doc, intellectually, most of us know that that's not what happens, but we still function that way. That's why we get, that's why we act like plumbers. We go in and, and try to clean out a, an area with a stent. You know, stents and other things that we call um, a flow study type of interventions are based on that concept. And at some point, when you get like two-thirds occlusion or more, two-thirds blockage of the artery, that does work and that is helpful. But long before that, uh, development of plaque and this inflammation process is a biochemical process. It's not occurring in one area. It's not a single flow area. It's all the arteries in the body. That's the concept, and again, although docs may know it, they really haven't studied the literature well enough, for the most part, to understand how to practice that way. Brad and Amy have, and the, again, that's why the book is so interesting. They do a, a series of seminars where, and I attended a few and learned enough of them to, to become certified in their type of practice and that type of thing. One of the things that you see is that docs get interested. They, then they get excited when they go to these three-day seminars, and they say, I'm going to go home and change my practice into a cardiovascular inflammation prevention program. And then it doesn't work. It isn't because the science that, that Brad and Amy are quoting doesn't work. It's because most docs are still in an insurance or fee-for-service-based environment. Now you can do this in a fee-for-service or in, uh, insurance-based environment. Um, David Wright, who's a, a good friend and physician that's, that's doing this in Memphis, has done it. Um, Amy uh, Irvin, who, the NP that works with us, has done that with Dr. Wright. Um, again, it can be done, but it's not easy. Uh, I think Brad will, will tell you he's not a big... He, he, he's challenged, he, he admits it's very challenging to try to do this in a uh, fee-for-service type of environment. So most of us are in more of a uh, concierge type of environment. Why is payment such an issue in terms of doing this? Well, here's why. It gets back to uh, people and their understanding and, and the basis of what this is. These are three-hour meetings usually four-hour meetings. You remember I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, patients uh, read this book and get interested as well. Well, the patients that come in to us, probably about half of them, clearly more than a third, 
have already read this book. When they've read this book, it's sort of like that old retail phenomenon you used to hear with Sims and some of the other retailers. An informed customer is our best customer. Well, the same thing with this. Someone who's read this book is clearly our best patient because they understand it's not totally new information and they don't get fogged out when we start talking about, well, APOE4 could be a risk. LP to little a could be a risk. It's not the, it's not the plaque that blocks your artery. It's the, uh, it's the embolus, the clot that comes from it. Now, what do we mean by that? Um, well, again, let's, let's go back and just review some of that science piece just a little bit to, to help <clears throat> create some understanding here. So our body's full of arteries. And again, we're not talking about one specific artery. We're talking about what's going on biochemically in the blood. The, there are a couple of layers in an artery that are very, very important. One is the intima layer. It's about a cell thick, very thin. doesn't create any structural uh, support. It's there more for metabolic processes to keep the blood from clotting and uh, some things like that. The structure is provide, a strength is provided by the media. That's a muscle cell layer. Now, <clears throat> what normally happens once we're born, LDL, you remember the low-density lipoproteins, the little fat uh, particles that we measure in a cholesterol test, tends to go through this intima sometimes. But usually, it, those particles will continue to go through the media and um, get absorbed elsewhere. There's a study called CIMT, which again is very much used in, uh, Brad and Amy are big fans, it's a big part of the, the process and the book. It's called carotid intima media test. You look at the carotid because it's, it's an artery, all arteries have the same processes going on, and clearly there's, there's over a 90% correlation, depending on what you're looking at specifically with um, plaque in the carotid arteries versus plaque in the uh, coronary arteries. You get this uh, deposition of LDL. Now for some of us, that deposit happens much quicker. Now if you look at, this is an actual um, pathological slide. It's, a, it's someone who died from a heart attack. Uh, this is that muscle layer. This is that meat, that intima layer. And as you see, it goes right over this area. This is a close-up of that area. This is a waxy substance here, and it's the LDL. This is inflammation. What happens is, and this is another interesting, ironic thing about the book, even though the big thing about uh, a Baldenine practice and the Baldenine book on this is about inflammation as a cause of heart attack and stroke. You can read the book a couple of times and still not clearly understand what inflammation means in a cardiovascular perspective. Inflammation is exactly what it is with the inflammatory diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, rheumatoid arthritis creates as much increased risk for heart attack and stroke as diabetes. Now, why is that? <clears throat> because, again, it's, it's an inflamed immune system, or inflammation caused by the immune system. What's happened here is this. The immune system recognizes that this should not be there. It should be nice and clean and you should not have that pile up of the LDL. So what does it do when it sees something that shouldn't be there? It sends in antibodies, T cells, B cells. It starts actually liquefying that area by digesting it. There are enzymes involved like MPO, myeloperoxidase, and LPPLA2, uh, what we call plaque 2. I've got videos on those. You can take a, take a look at them. We actually test the blood, our patients, for the level of NPO and PLA2. That tells us a lot about the inflammatory process that's going on in their artery walls. 
Another thing we look for is called uh, microalbumin creatinine ratio, and that looks for cracks in this um, intima layer. So you start to get a little bit different understanding. Again, it's not like just the flow issue of where we think a plaque is building up to where it's uh, bl slowly blocking off the flow of an artery. It's where you get first plaque buildup and then inflammation. Then what happens? Once you have a, a pocket of inflammation, you have risk of that breaking back through the intima layer. This is the intima layer on a patient that also died of a heart attack. And as you can see, this intima layer covered up an area of inflammation, liquid inflamed plaque. There were a couple of cracks in the intima layer. Uh, it's labeled as tennis court here. In the book, Bailed, um, Beat the Heart Attack Gene, they, tend, they call this intima layer the tennis court. There are about six, the equivalent of six tennis courts of surface area in our bodies of intima. So again, that's where their term uh, tennis court comes from. Now, you see that this intima is here. The, you can't see the uh, media layer very well, but it's over here. And all of this is that white waxy substance that we saw in the previous uh, slide. Now, this black thing is a clot. It's not uh, inflammation. It's not inflamed plaque. That's more of a yellowish color. This is black. And what happened was that inflamed yellowish liquid plaque broke out and went into the artery wall. So again, to, to show it from this perspective, you had, a, an, you had plaque. An area of plaque became inflamed, liquefied, and then there was very little space and very little protecting that liquid plaque from the bloodstream. You got a crack in the intima or the tennis court. That leaked out and went into the bloodstream caused clot. So that is what has happened there. And again, <clears throat> if you can slow down that process, and you can, then you've got a, a very big advantage in terms of preventing heart attack, stroke, dementia, uh, and all the things associated with that. So <clears throat> after decades of Brad and Amy being sort of like prophets you know, preaching in the wilderness alone about prevention of heart attack and stroke through, um, through inflammation, it has now become a mainstream idea. I've actually even seen it in Mayo and Harvard uh, newsletters for the public. Uh, are there any, uh, what, what problems, what negative sides would I see with the book? With, with like any book dealing mostly with science, it gets outdated quickly. Already, there's a couple of issues. Haptoglobin, there's a major uh, driver of risk associated with haptoglobin. For any of us who have the haptoglobin 2, uh, 2 gene, it has to deal with gluten, and it's a very important issue for increased risk for diabetics. That's really become a, an operational uh, item that we can affect since the book was written. The book was written in 2014, so again, science moves very, very quickly. One other concept, the gene itself, 9P21, used to be known as a cancer gene. It was associated with uh, cancers such as melanoma first, but then some lymphomas, um, uh, gut or uh, large intestine uh, tumors. Then it was found out just, uh, just before writing this book that it was also associated with heart attack and stroke. Since then, it's also become clear that it's associated with diabetes. Diabetes and insulin resistance cause three quarters of the uh, inflammation associated with heart attack and stroke risk. So again, you start to see the, the picture grow. Uh, in summary, if you haven't read that book and if you're at all interested in this topic, I think that's the number one book I would read. Then I'd start thinking about reading Blood Sugar 101 and a couple of other books. Thank you.